A major redevelopment project in Plymouth got a fresh look recently. Developers see it as a future iconic destination. I spoke with city leaders to find out where things stand. Plymouth city leaders new to council and city hall got a look at the former Prudential site at an informal meeting earlier this week. We have three new council members who you know, weren't as familiar with the project. We also have some new staff, including myself, um, who don't have a lot of history with the, with the site. So we took a, a tour of the, of the property. The 75-acre site could be a mixed-use development a la Centennial Lakes in Edina. The plans could include retail, restaurants, and a variety of housing options, along with natural and other outdoor amenities, just like Centennial Lakes. These are plans initially presented last year. We were all surprised by the abundance of nature, the rolling topography, how quiet it was in certain locations. You know, it's relatively close to the freeway. So I think we were expecting noise to be a bigger issue and we were really surprised. The city hopes to start seeing some plans and the permitting process come together later this summer or into the fall. Until then, the city will continue to focus its plans with the developer. We both want to see the site developed. We have, I think, a slightly different vision for what that looks like. And I think both sides recognize there, there was the need to sit down and take a pause and really revisit the original goals. In Brooklyn Center on Friday morning, a scare for riders waiting for a Metro Transit bus. According to police, a vehicle traveling southbound on Xerxes Avenue struck a vehicle that was stopped behind a bus. The force of that collision sent the stopped vehicle through a portion of a bus shelter and into the IHOP parking lot. A man that was waiting in the bus shelter was taken to a hospital. We're told his injuries are minor at this time. Brooklyn Park Mayor Hollis Winston spent much of his State of the City address this week discussing public safety. They don't feel maybe that same sense of security. They're and, and the uncomfortable truth is they're right. Things do feel different. Uh, and we have to be aware that Brooklyn Park we are in the eye of a public safety storm, and the young people in our city need our attention now more than ever before. Mayor Winston said gaps in the juvenile justice system allow at-risk youth to fall through the cracks. He said the police alternative response team is helping to keep those with mental health issues out of the criminal justice system. Meanwhile, partnerships with organizations like the Village BP aim to reduce violence and connect people with resources. And his full speech is available to watch on the city's Facebook page. The Osseo Police Department added a full-time officer to its ranks this week. Officer Ryan Swanson previously served as a community service officer with the Corcoran Police Department. According to Chief Shane Michelson, the department still has two open positions. The department is smaller than many in this region, but Swanson will join four other full-time officers and six part-time Osseo officers. Two local students are joining an elite group of high school seniors honored as U.S. Presidential Scholars. Stavia Aurora of Maple Grove High School and Matthew Chen of Wyzetta High School represent the state of Minnesota. They are among 161 high school seniors nationwide chosen for the honor, which recognizes academic success, artistic and technical excellence, and community service and leadership. The city of Brooklyn Park recently received some special recognition. As Delane Cleveland reports, a local nonprofit says the city has gone above and beyond to enhance the lives of those with disabilities. We are going to go over and do our fitness walk today. After a long and snowy winter. So let's go down this way. Most Minnesotans are looking for any excuse to get outside. So we are doing 20 standing marches today. One. Two. And on a recent Wednesday at Brooklyn Park's Community Activity Center. 19, 20. Sound good? Aaron Bonikowski wanted this group to get a breath of fresh air. Ooh, nice work. And burn a few calories in the process. I am so excited to go to work every day. I get to do super fun things. I get to work with people of all ages, all abilities, support them in our program. So calf raises, who remembers calf raises? This particular program is called Adaptive Fitness. Two, three. It's one of several recreation options offered by the city's Parks and Rec Department 
for people with developmental disabilities. It's important because everybody deserves to be included in our programs. Brooklyn Park really puts an emphasis on inclusion, so we want to make sure our whole community feels included and that they can all participate with us. So you move our arms forward. Brooklyn Park's emphasis on inclusive programming is one of the reasons why the local nonprofit Reach for Resources recognized the city as this year's Community Partner of the Year. Brooklyn Park, I think, goes really above and beyond with their accommodations. Emily Orr is with Reach for Resources. Get some water if you need it. She says Brooklyn Park has made significant contributions to enhancing the lives of people with disabilities. Brooklyn Park has also taken steps to have a consultant come out and look at how their parks are accommodating people with disabilities and made changes based on those recommendations. Eleven. It's the sort of thing that many people might over Look. But for the folks who benefit from ADA accessible programming, a little consideration goes a long way. I'm really happy that more people are starting to implement this into their work um, because it is it is the law and it's something that should be a part of everything that we do. In Brooklyn Park, Delaine Cleveland, CCX News. Exciting news for those who like to shop for local goods and produce. The Maple Grove Farmer's Market has started its outdoor season. More than 50 vendors will set up shop this year in the parking lot in front of the Maple Grove Community Center. A wide range of items for sale include frozen meats, plants for the garden, homemade pierogies, and popular drinks like kombucha. There's some new vendors this year, too. We have some a cheese vendor, a chocolate bar vendor, um, we have a banana bread vendor, and we have a pet vendor coming in. So, you know, trying to change things up and try to make it uh, more diverse for, for our customers. You can check out the farmer's market every Thursday afternoon and evening from now until mid-October. It's opening weekend for walleye fishing in Minnesota. We caught up with longtime CCX fishing contributor Terry Tuba to ask him what he thinks about the 2023 opener. We're going to have a very good opener, especially in certain parts of the area of the state. You know, the southern part is going to be really good. And as we go further north, we're probably going to change to, due to water temperatures. And water temperatures are going to affect a walleye location, you know, the spawn, the pre-spawn, post-spawn. I anticipate most of these lakes are going to be in that post-spawn period, uh, again, depending on strictly water temperatures. And once we hit that 50 degree, we can anticipate some pretty pretty good bites. It's going to be warmer on some of these bodies of water, especially in the southern part of the state, and these fish should really be biting. Where's the best place for people to get information on a lake, especially if, perhaps if they haven't fished it before? Well, first of all, what I would do is, you know, make sure you get some information from the DNR as far as stocking program, that you got uh, a plentiful amount of walleyes in it. A lot of these, they do have a lot of walleyes in it, even though we sometimes think they don't have very many in. That's not always true. And then, you know, take a look at the map and look at, you know, what kind of structure these things, these fish are going to be at, relating to, or it's going to be weeds. And then, two, check with a bait shop, or if you know some friends in that specific area, ask them, too, what they anticipate, what it's going to produce for them. What's the, the preferred bait that you like to use uh, for walleyes on, on the opener compared to, say, if you're fishing them in August? Well, where we're going to be fishing, John, jig and a minnow is going to be a starting point, but also a jig and leech. If you're running short on minnows or leeches, use jig and plastic. Jigs and plastic, especially if you've got a good bite going, can be extremely productive. Uh, a lot cheaper, if you will, uh, but also extremely productive. And then from there, uh, you know, leeches work on jigs, leeches work on live bait rigs. And as I mentioned, too, when you get that 60 degree range, uh, night cars can be extremely productive, especially on live bait rigs. We talk about walleyes a lot because it's a walleye opener, but this is a good time to catch uh, the other fish too, right? Oh, no question about it. I hear this, con and we've been in that situation too, John, where we had a, um, some terrible spring weather out there, freezing with ice fishing gear and so forth, and we had a tough bite going for the walleyes, but we nailed some big, big crappies. And crappies and sunfish are always a go-to. A lot of anglers will fish just strictly crappies and sunfish on opening weekend and then challenge the walleyes the following weekend. And you'll be working the Mississippi River again this year, right? Oh, yes, no question about it. That's our, sort of our go-to opener. Uh, it's going to be interesting this year with the high water and dropping, how the fluctuation is going to affect walleye location. I anticipate we're going to have to do a little bit of looking to find those fish. And Terry will be back later this month for the first of his weekly summer fishing tips here on CCX. Maple Grove and Armstrong have been the top two teams in Northwest Suburban lacrosse this season. The Crimson scored a big road win when the teams met up earlier this week. 
Seven and one it's a battle for first place in Northwest Virginia Suburban Conference Cats Boys Lacrosse Wednesday as uh, Armstrong hosted Maple brilliant. Grove. Tied at one in the second quarter. Rory Scanlon passes to Landon Bakke and he scores for the Crimson. One of three goals in the game for Bakke. Later in the quarter, the Falcons' Nate Albrecht passes to Frankie Annis, who comes out front, shoots and scores, and the game is tied at three. Maple Grove's Tanner Brendan passes to Ricky Peterson, who jumps up and finds their short side for a goal. The Crimson take a 5-4 lead in the halftime. Third quarter, Tyler Steinkopf to Brendan, who manages to shoot and score despite taking a lot of contact. His goal puts the Crimson up 7-5. Nice moves here by Armstrong freshman Brady Northrup. He gets free and scores, and it's a one-goal game at 8-7. But Maple Grove closes strong in the fourth quarter. Rory Scanlon dodges defenders here, and his goal makes it 9-7. Great transition work here by the Crimson. Hale Farniak with a save, a quick outlet pass to Briggs Leiser, and then Leiser to Scanlon who winds and fires and scores again. Scanlon nets four goals in the fourth quarter and five in the game. Maple Grove takes over sole possession of first place in the Northwest Suburban Conference with a 13-8 win over Armstrong. Find more prep sports games and highlights at ccxmedia.org and follow us on social media.